Thanks everyone um, for joining us from um, both all around Australia and overseas. Um, welcome to our webinar from ACFA. Um, this was a couple of the presentations that we were hoping to present in South Australia at our conference in August. So um, unfortunately due to COVID, which seems to have messed up everything this year, we weren't able to do that. So we thought it was a good opportunity to share a couple of the presentations with you um, and uh, then um, hopefully next year we'll be in a position that we're able to run the conference again. So first we're going to start with um, Charlie French from Forbes in New South Wales and Charlie farms um, with his family and his cropping and also irrigated cropping and um, dry land cropping. So I'll hand it over to Charlie and he can explain a little bit more about your farming, uh, his farming system. And um, as you go, you are welcome to answer questions or we'll give you or ask questions and you can use the chat function if you like. Otherwise, we'll um, give time for questions at the end of the presentation. All right, Charlie, over to you. Righto. Um, you can hear me, Bendy? Yep, all good. Yep. Righto. So, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Hopefully you uh, picked something up here. It's probably all that you've heard before, but anyway... Um, some of the greatest things I've learned and heard are from yeah, talking to other farmers and, and things like that. So hopefully there's maybe one bit of information that you uh, find in yeah find good or whatever you might be able to use at your place. So I'm yeah 26 years old. Um, I farm with my parents um, at Forbes in central New South Wales. I've got a brother and a sister who are both in uh, non-ag related industries in Sydney. So they got the brains, but I've got the passion, I'd say. Um, we're 65 k's from town, um, from Forbes, Condo and West Wylong. So we're sort of in the, the centre of, of a triangle there. Um, so that in its own is a bit of a challenge being so far from town uh, in terms of parts and stuff and all those things. Um, away from the farm, I play rugby and that's, yeah, sort of my two passions are rugby and farming. Um, as Bindi said, we grow yeah, winter dryland cereals and pulses. Um, and when water's available, we grow irrigated popcorn in the summer. Uh, we've also got a herd of Angus Hereford cross cows. Uh, my passion is definitely the uh, winter cropping. Um, and it sort of, yeah, always has been. Uh, we've got a range of soils, some uh, sandy red loams, which are our probably most productive, uh, into some red mile-ish clays, um, and then some heavy gray clay on the edge of a floodplain. Um, so hopefully this will change slides for what we do, sorry. Yeah, and there's just a few images along the way, some an irrigation field, some cows, and then some uh, harvesting, CTF unloading on the go, um, sort of the pinnacle for me, making that all happen was, was pretty awesome. So yeah, why CTF? Uh, so I don't think I mentioned, but I did agribusiness at UNE and sort of learnt a lot of facts and, and all that about agriculture. And the fact that 90% of compaction occurs in the first uh, pass really um, set the alarm bells off um, for me. And that was a big one. Like, yeah, if, if that's happening in the first pass, we need to just traffic a certain area of the, the paddock. Um, the gains made, it just, it just sort of makes sense, giving the, the plants the best chance of survival and growing um, to their ability, where it's sort of in a marginal area, you would say, with rainfall. So giving it um, the best chance it has, I think, is very important. Um, so, yeah, a few years back now, maybe five or six or seven, I guess it was, we um, sort of changed our farming program a bit. We used to... Our, Rotation used to be a wheat, um, canola, barley, wheat, and then it would go into a loosened pasture for five years. Um, that worked not too badly, but uh, the problem with that was you've got to cultivate to get rid of the block when you bring the loosen out, but also because loosen has got such a big taproot on it, it drew the profile down and it was sort of not, the, not until the third or fourth year that we um, were getting sort of reasonable moisture back in the profile. So... We went away from that and now we've got an area of uh, the farm that we continuously crop, um, which is a, a wheat, uh, wheat, barley, pulse, wheat rotation. 
Um, and then and then the other area, the, the less arable soils and a bit of hilly timbered country, we uh, run the cattle on and we improve those pastures just to get out the best sort of bang for our buck and, and grow some healthy big cattle is the plan there. Um, yeah, so the CTF timeline, um, it sort of started a, a while ago when Dad changed from a, uh, a tine seeder to a disc seeder in about 2000. Um, because you sort of can't see the, the area you've disturbed in the paddock. He went to um, some form of guidance and that was, yeah, just a light bar. Now I can't remember that too well. I was a bit young to sort of be driving it and, and doing all those things. But yeah, that was on an old case tractor. Um, that's an old Steiger thing. And then, yeah, we upgraded the header in, in 2003. And um, it, we didn't have guidance on that to start with, but we had 36 foot front, the same as the planter. So we were, so we were matching up there, um, which was, I guess, a step in the right direction. In, yeah, in 2005, we updated the tractor um, and got the auto farm guidance, uh, which is still an amazing product. And back then, I think two centimeter repeatable RTK was a thing as well and truly uh, before it's time. We put the, the auto steer on the header then. Um, so that lined all that up and that was working quite well. Uh, we then, yeah, decided to get rid of the header um, just for a few reasons, but the biggest one was staffing. Uh, when we were irrigating, we needed a, crew, a massive crew and it was becoming quite difficult to do. So we got a contractor who's, we're still using him and he's fantastic. Um, and yeah, so 12 metre front, so that threw that out a bit. We had a bit of a phase where we went off. But anyway, um, 2013, we, we went to Trimble Gardens, which we're still using and, and very happy with. Um, and then in 2014, that sort of all happened. We uh, had been using a, a contractor for spraying um, and, and had used the same guy for what Dad started with him, but he retired. So, yeah, time to buy a sprayer. We did that, um, yeah, 36 metre, updated the planter and put the tractor that was pulling it on three metre wheel centres. So I guess 2014 was when it all happened. Um, yeah, sorry, In that, that first spray was 36 metre, uh, the boom was factory made, so we had to just plumb some extra nozzles onto the end. Um, not sure how that went for uh, even rates and all that sort of stuff. I was still at Union, wasn't too involved then, but anyway, it worked. Uh, yeah, 2017 we updated a tractor and uh, got a road tractor, Case Steiger, on, on three metre centres and tracks. Um, so that was awesome. It's a nice tractor. And then, um, yeah, got the chaser bin on the tram lines with the uh, cases, extended auger and, and all that sort of stuff. And then in 2018, we updated the sprayer again and, um, yeah, got a, a Pommier aluminium boom, which is 36.6 metres, so it all fits perfectly. And that's just sort of a few images there, that, that header and chaser bin unloading off the tram lines um, in the early days. But that's yeah, it's all a compromise, and and um, I'm glad that we've got over that, and it's been pretty happy with where we are now. That's just the sprayer, and and then a um, a tractor and planter. Uh, that was the first year with that planter and that old blue tractor on three metre wheel centres. Um, so we're in a yeah, as I said, a pretty variable climate. Um, rainfall, I'd like to think, is our most limiting factor year in year out. Um, as you can see there. There's a huge variability in 2000 and uh, that was in 2019. Yeah, 100, 193 mils. And then year to date today, um, we're nearly, yeah, we're about 497. So huge difference. But with rain being the limiting factor, um, stubble retention is key and making every drop count, I guess. So yeah, getting as much infiltrated and stored in the profile as we can. Um, and yeah, you having the, the CTF line, so we're not compacting the rest of the arable area and, and all those sorts of things. CTF just sort of makes sense. Um, a few challenges, as you can see there, that photo, I was uh, a pre-plant knockdown and the front wheels have stayed up on the tram line and the back wheels actually slipped off and I uh, got stuck. It was, um, yeah, quite amazing when that happened. I was, um, yeah, quite shocked that it was, such a difference, just a little bit of variance. I slipped off and, and it was game over. Um, the biggest challenge probably was when we first started out the, uh, yeah, the different, the imperial and metric sizes. So 
John Deere planter was 12.2 metres and the sprayer was 36 metres. Um, the header front was 12 metres. So we had to actually extend the Macdon front. The local engineer did that for the contractor. And then, as I said, fiddled with the sprayer. Um, another thing was when we first set out, just, just getting it into the machinery operator's minds that the traffic lanes were where they spent their time. Um, you know, if you were spraying and you ran out not to do a UE and head diagonally across the paddock to the gate to, you know, run dry to the end of the run, turn around and, and um, head back, which, you know, they, yeah, anyway, that was a challenge, but we finally got there. Um, and then, yeah, the, the header auger and the, and the, um, and all that, well, yeah, that was, it's a compromise, but we've, we've finally got there. Um, moving on, that's just a few images, yeah, so as you see, the header auger, um, we actually had to put a bit of a rubber chute on the, on the auger because it's set out for a, a 40 foot front and we're 42 feet, so we're just a bit of rubber um, on the end of the, the case chute and that shoots it straight into the chaser bin, uh, the middle of the chaser bin, so you can get two full box fulls in a 25 ton chaser bin. Um, and it's chocker block full and the chase bin hasn't got a nudge off the line, uh, which is, yeah, pretty good. And there you can see those wheel tracks. That's on some um, heavy edge of the floodplain soil and they're getting quite deep. So re we haven't renovated them as yet, but I think that could be something we've got to look to uh, moving forward. Um, so after we've sort of set the farm up, um, the way we have now with farming paddocks and and uh, livestock paddocks, we um, yeah really wanted to make things as efficient as we can. So we've set up a nurse trailer for spraying, um, which is fantastic. Sort of day in day out, we can average about sixty hectares an hour with filling in the sprayer. So we're uh, we're getting lots of country done, which is good. Um, before that, we we did finish be empty fold the wings and head back to two uh, central points on the farm um, to fill up just at big water tanks. And we'll, you were sort of losing an hour each from, from wings in to wings out was an hour. So now we're 12 to 15 minutes and we're going again, which is um, yeah huge gain and, and money really well spent. Um, another thing after a, a trip to WA with our agronomist in 2017, we saw um, a couple of these tornado seed and fertiliser trailers. And we'd always uh, thought we needed something a bit better. Um, we just used a, a rigid truck with a tipping tray and a divider in it and used that for years. And look, it worked fine. It was a bit slow and, and constantly needed filling up. Um, we saw these tornadoes and sort of fell in love with them. And yeah, we, we bought one of them and it's um, the greatest piece of machinery build, I think. It's so good, it's quick, it's easy. And it's almost idiot proof, it's safe. Um, there's no risk of tipping it over in a paddock. Uh, so yeah, that's, um, that's pretty good, pretty happy with that. And it doubles at harvest time. We can use it for carting grain, both on farm and, and into the, in the town silos. So the perfect paddock, you, also, you often um, yeah, get this question, what's the perfect paddock? How would you set it up? Um, yeah, so we've, we've tried to build 12 metre roads um, where we can evenly space for our average yield. So the chaser bins um, unloading back to the road on either end and can dump and go as quick as they can get back to the header. So we chose 12 metres because that's just about the size of the planter, but also we can fit the chaser bin, the mother bin and a truck on the road all at one time. Um, we're not driving on stubbles or, or anything like that. So yeah, our average wheat yields about um, 2.7 tonne of the hectare. So we've worked on the, the area to do an up and an up and back and then, but yeah, and the, the amount of grain in the bin. Um, we've got a, yeah, carrying on with the perfect paddock. We've got three lines saved in our, in our auto steer. So we've got the master line that the sprayer, uh, the spreader and the harvester run on. And then there's a line which is seven and a half centimetres shifted to the left or the right, either side in the planter. And we go sort of, yeah, in, in one in every three years, you can understand we're on, on either line. And that's just so we can um, get, a, get a nice inter-row 
uh, put the planter evenly in the inter-row and um, inter-row so nicely, but we're not yet moving too far off the line. Um, moving forward, I'm not sure whether a hydraulic drawbar isn't the go, um, just to keep the tractor dead set on the master line, but at the moment we're doing that and it seems to be working not too badly. Um, we've, as I said before, we've got some heavy timbered country and um, with that it's got some benefits, but it's also a bit unarable. But one of the real benefits is because there's so many trees, <laughs> the, LA, the local land services in New South Wales have approved us to take the, scat the scattered paddock timber. So um, that'll be at least the perfect paddock, I think. We're, we're efficient. Uh, we haven't got areas affected by moisture stress due to trees. And um, yeah, all those things. Oh, and that, yeah, the fence line. Sorry, I'm going backwards here a bit, but yeah, changing the boundaries and the fences. So we've got, pardon me, a one meter gap between the edge of the, the field and the fence. So we can get down there with a four wheel bike and, and spray it and keep fence lines clean and, and all those things. Yeah, so, so if we're starting fresh, um, which we did, uh, in a few paddocks last year, and I think someone that's listening in actually did some contract spreading for us. But so we clean up the paddocks, take the timber that we're allowed to, and then we um, variable rate lime. So we have a, a soil test every one every two hectares to create a, a VR map. Um, and we do the lime, and then we final incorporate that with a final cultivation. Uh, with a, a sheer trash worker that we can sink into the ground quite deep, um, bust any compaction, and then Kelly chain it or grade aboard it and get it, get a nice slick finish, and then um, and get into our fixed rotation of the wheat, the barley, pulse wheat, and keep all the stubble, um, and then control the summer weeds and and uh, hope for a bit of rain over the summer period that, that fills the profile and off we go again next year. Um, the benefit, the advantages, I guess, for us, or the the benefits. So yeah, reduced fuel use. Um, when you, that's all the research is out there, and I'm sure you've all seen it. But the um, yeah, the the roll factor and actually rolling across those hard lines um, has reduced fuel, particularly in the sprayer. Um, that sprayer of ours is really fuel efficient. Um, it's, yeah, I think it was sort of like half a yeah, litre, a bit less than a litre of hectare. Um, higher crop yields, obviously, and trafficability on wet fields, which um, up until this year we hadn't really had to worry about. But uh, we did some spraying in July and August that was, um, yeah, there was actually water. I haven't got any photos, but there was water laying on the tram lines. Um, but we sort of managed to power through. As you can see there, this is on some... Uh, some heavy soil, but you see there, there's water laying on the tram line, but in the field area between the rows, there's um, there's no water at all, which is uh, quite good, I think. Yeah, it means the soil's taking it in. It's not compacted, and uh, that's all happening. Um, here, we've just done, this year done a little trial of uh, another uh, benefit of talking to farmers and things like that. We've seen some guys at Mara in the Riverina, New South Wales, growing uh, companion crops with their winter cereals. So we thought this year, we'd why not, we'd give it a go on some of our worst performing soil just to see whether we can't uh, move it along a bit. And as you can see that, the, the uh, plant there with the long tuber has gone down in some untrafficked area and the one with the right angle bend was actually on the tram line. It's gone down and found that deep compaction and uh, called it quits and speared off to the side. Um, so yeah, that was really interesting. I thought I thought uh, the compaction might have been a bit more towards the top, but it pushed through the top not too badly, and then it's um, sort of quits. And then uh, the other photo was after a um, a storm during harvest time in 2017. We're harvesting on that heavy um, floodplain country, and yeah, the chaser bin was just staying on the tram lines, but just making an absolute mess, getting grain in and out of the way out of the field. So that's a challenge, but, a, but I'm glad it happened on the tram line rather than across the paddock. We just had to run over that with a plough and, and sort of fill it in. Um, they were sort of, yeah, a foot or a foot deeper. They were quite big. Um, yeah, CTF's a no-brainer in our system. Um, 
that's not a very good photo, but this was last year, October last year. Now, that barley yielded 0.9 of a tonne of the hectare and the wheat was a bit less than that. But um, I don't think last year, if we weren't in a CTF system with stubble retention and, and the rest, uh, I don't think we would have harvested a grain. So uh, the system's working together. There and, and in our system, it just works. And, um, yeah, I'm really glad we're doing it because I think we're growing grain where uh, that just sort of doesn't happen. Um, and there, oh, sorry. Yeah, so there's some inter row sowing and um, that's uh, – could we grew here. We've, we've actually scrapped canola from our rotation, but that's some narrow windrow burning in canola, which also works works with CTF, um, that was really good. There was a bit of ryegrass in that and some other weeds. And um, and with the disc seeder, we found we had trouble uh, seeding at an even depth into canola trash that wasn't spread evenly. So we found the best thing was to put in the wrong burner. Um, so yeah, agric uh, agricultural technologies being passed around that are, that are helping everyone that takes them on. Uh, so what's next for us um, this year? We've got a stripper front coming, um, as well as a chaff deck. So I'm really excited about the stripper front and what it might do for us. Uh, all the research is there that it's going to uh, conserve more moisture and, and give us more opportunities. Um, so, yeah, pumped about that. It's been a long time coming. Well, not so much a long time coming, but a conversation started many years ago with um, some local farmers and some, some guys um, in a different area that are pretty switched on dudes and we've worked away and we finally got it uh, for this year. We're also going to put a chaff deck on the header. Uh, there was a bit of ryegrass that has popped up yet this year that we hadn't seen before. So we'll put that on there and uh, try and yeah, neutralize that to one area, which I think is important. If you're sort of in front of the, the eight ball and those sort of things, it's better than being reactive. Um, and just everything to give its yeah give the plant the best opportunity. Um, I'd like to give a, an optical sprayer a, a go, and maybe a demo just to see how they work in the stripper stubble. Um, I don't think it's going to be too far, and some problem weeds like feather top roads and things like that'll be on our doorstep. So that's all challenges that no doubt will come in the future. But if we are aware of them and and um, sort of setting ourselves up, I think we can take them on a bit better. So thanks for that. Hopefully it didn't bore you too much. No, it was great. Thanks, Charlie. Some good um, practical tips and things you've been doing. Are there any questions from everybody else? Uh, Bindi? Yes. Yeah, just, just a quick question for Charlie. Um, um, just as a bit of a, a comparison um, for him, um, I, I know it's a bit hard, but if he if he speaks to his neighbours, if they are on controlled traffic, has he noticed the differences in crops uh, over the fence um, if they're not on CTF compared to his? Uh, yeah, I sort of didn't want to say too much, but yeah, last year I think painted a pretty good picture. Um, yeah, we were lucky enough to harvest a bit of grain and um, there weren't too many others that did. So I guess that answers that question quite well. Yes, okay, great. Hey Charlie, it's Nigel Wilhelm from South Australia. Thanks for the presentation, great job. A question for you, if, if you were faced a situation where you had to harvest in a different direction or something to capture a a lodge crop, what's your reaction to that versus being um, a slave to the CTF lines? Uh, that's a tough one and I'm, I'm not sure really how I would go about that. Hopefully I never would, but I guess it's a, a challenge that's, that could happen. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know whether 45 degrees might be the best over 90, just because 90 would be very rough um, heading over the lock, like, yeah, yeah, crossing the tram lines, even though they're not too deep, they are a little bit deep and the machinery bounce and things like that, 45 probably would be better than 90. Okay, thanks. 
What was your rainfall for last year there, Charlie, to get those 0.8, 0.9 tonne crop? Uh, 193 mils, was it? With 30, I should have had 30 mils um, growing season. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, that is unbelievable. Charlie, I had a question um, about your sprayer uh, set up there with the nurse tag. Is that something you designed yourself or is that something you saw somewhere and you replicated it? Yeah, so we, when we um, did our trip to WA in 2017 with um, Chris Baker and his clients, our agronomist, we saw several nurse setups. Um, the take-home one was Mark Wandell's. Anyone who's seen that, it's just, it's next level. It's amazing. So we uh, replicated that where we could and um, just tinkered with a few things that were going to yeah, suit us the best. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Um, are there any other questions for Charlie? Uh, <clears throat> quick one. Um, Kim Russell here. Thanks for your presentation, Charlie. It was great. When you mentioned the uh, hydraulic drawbar, I presume that would give you lateral move to keep things in track? Yes, that's right. So they call them a pro tracker and it's steered by guidance on the bar. Um, and so the the tractor would stay on the on the master line and then the bar move laterally um, either way to be yeah uh, to be that constant seven and a half centimeters off the um, off the previous year's plant line. Hello, thank you very much. Right, we've got time for a couple more if there are any others. Yeah Charlie I just had a question You've obviously had some tough conditions there, uh, farming the dry. And apart from the lack of rainfall, uh, with the CTF system, what's sort of some of the other challenges that you've had there? Um, in, so in growing the crop, like challenges around CTF or challenges in terms oh, of Oh, just in general crop. on the farm and apart from the lack of rainfall, I mean, you've had some tough years there. And how has this year gone in comparison to those last three or four years? Yeah, it's been, it's been pretty wild. Um, so in 16, we had a pretty severe flood um, and obviously lost our wet country, but there was a few, um, yeah, a few banks built that shouldn't have been built that pushed water where it shouldn't have been. So 16 was a total wipeout for us. Just about um, 17, uh, we obviously had a lot of residual moisture um, and, and things were, were really good. Uh, a bit of frost, which usually doesn't affect us too bad, not like it does um, the guys in South Australia or, or a bit further east from us. And then, yeah, 19, well, 18 and 19 were um, yeah, both quite dry. But that's the, you take that, don't you? And then this year's shaping up to be um, absolutely fantastic. That's great. Hey, Charlie, I have one for you. You mentioned um, wheel track renovation. What are you going, looking at using for that? Uh, probably just a, um, one of those grizzly renovators, a, a guy that's also in the, um, the agronomy group with us has one. So I hopefully could just get a lend of it and just... Yeah, fluff the outsides up and, and put them back in the middle and um, and go from there. I, I, it's not too big of an issue like it is on those um, rich soils of the Liverpool Plains where they are renovating their sprayer lines every year. Like ours aren't, aren't sinking anywhere like that. So it's, it's not a huge issue. But I guess uh, if it does happen to be wet at harvest this year or anything like that, instead of ploughing them, I'd probably try <coughs> to renovate and, and just, yeah, keep all the stubble. Yep. So, Charlie, Nigel Wilhelm here again. I see you, you've got a chaff deck coming, so I guess you're planning to keep your chaff in that line under the, between the tram lines. Do you see yourself doing that sort of for the foreseeable future, just keeping that chaff in that line forever type of thing? 
Yeah, I do. I think um, there's a few benefits there. You um, centralise the weed seeds, but also uh, eliminate some of the dust in your summer spraying, which I think um, we all know that dust and, and glide don't go too well together. So if we can keep that dust down and get a better spray result, uh, that's a huge advantage. So, yeah, looking uh, moving forward, looking at yeah, harvesting everything with the chaff deck. And you're hoping that will mulch down the weed seeds, that sort of thing? Yes, it, um, it might, or if not, we'll just um, build a, a little chaff deck spray out, I guess. Dolly, it's Chris Blewett here. If, if you go into that uh, chaff line, will you go on sowing your wheel tracks or leave, leave the chaff lines on sown? Uh, next year, we'll plant them and see what happens. Um, yeah, at the moment, I just, I think we'll plant them and, and yeah, if that, if they don't grow or it's, yeah, it's a, there's a challenge there, then we won't. But at the moment, my plan is to plant them. It, I'm, I'm sure it will won't be perfect. Um, as it is, the, the tram lines are getting quite compacted and not much is growing, but penetrating that chaff fraction with the disc seeder could be a problem. Um, so we'll just put it in as deep as it'll go and yeah, see what happens. Yeah, sorry, sorry if I missed it, but are you sowing your, your wheel tracks? Yeah, sorry, we currently are, yes. Um, there's not a whole lot growing in them, but there's a little bit. And um, yeah, that's, I don't know. At the moment we're doing it. I don't know whether it's right or wrong, but that's what we're doing. All right, great. I think, um, thanks very much, Charlie, for that excellent presentation. And you've got lots of good questions there. Um, Can you sneak one in, Mindy? Uh, just because it's you, Luke, yeah. <laughs> what are they going to yield this year? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I think if we could if we could average five tonne of the hectare a little bit more, that would be um, amazing. We'll have some do better than that and probably some do worse, but yeah, I think, yeah, if we can do five or a bit better, that'd be a great result. Excellent. I think there'd be a lot that I'd love a bit of that. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, Charlie. If you'd like to end sharing your screen and we'll change the next topic now. Great, thank you. All right, now we're going to move on to uh, soil amelioration bloopers. And um, this is me. So um, I don't know if you know what the definition of a blooper is, but the definition of a blooper is an embarrassing um, mistake. Now, I'm not sure that many of the what I'm going to show you today are embarrassing, although my husband, did, uh, who's a mechanic for one of the John Deere dealers over here in Western Australia, came home with a good tip from one of his customers. And he said, if you happen to make a blooper in the front paddock, if you put up a few pegs and put some trial tape around it, uh, or flagging tape, you can call it a trial and no one will know any different. So um, that's something uh, you can keep in mind when you have a blooper that happens in the front paddock. So I thought I'd share some bloopers with you because as, as scientists and researchers, we always show you the good things that can happen. And there's a lot of talk about soil amelioration and a lot of trial work and uh, you can get some amazing benefits um, from soil amelioration, but there can also be some mistakes and some of these can be long lasting. So what I've put together is a collection of bloopers and experiences from um, farmers and researchers in Western Australia um, that we've collected as part of our uh, GRDC funded project that we've been working on for the last five years. So for those of you who don't know who I am, um, my name is Bindi Isvista. I'm a research scientist based in Geraldton in Western Australia. And I worked predominantly on soil um, compaction and soil management, and more recently um, into sort of more broader soil amelioration practices. So let's get started. Now, this is, because it's a bloopers, uh, it is a bit of a show reel. So some things I'm going to go through um, quickly and other things we're going to um, pause on and talk a little bit more in detail. 
So let's get started. Now, that, as we go through, I want you to keep in mind three things uh, that you need to know before you, in, or keep in mind when you embark on soil amelioration. The first one, you need to know your soil profile. So you need to have an understanding of what soil you're actually going to be mixing um, or, or turning up. Um, the second one is ameliorate to the conditions, not the calendar. So it is a bit tempting um, when you've got time in autumn and the tractors aren't being used to get in there and do some spading and in um, wall wadding, but there is a really high risk of erosion. So you need to um, keep that in mind and wait till conditions are right. And the other one is, if in doubt, leave it out. So make sure as you go, you're checking what you're doing um, and not looking right, we recommend stopping um, and waiting because the mistakes you can make can last for a long time. So the first blooper off the list is be careful um, with pre-emergent herbicides post amelioration. So, and this is particularly a problem with soil inversion, with moldboard ploughing and um, spading, because you reduce the amount of soil organic matter. And I guess I'm particularly talking about sandy soils here. And it just makes the um, pre-emergent herbicides work more effectively. So quite a bit of work being done on this. And I suggest if you have any more questions about that, you can contact Tim, um, oh, Tom Edwards down in Esperance with Department of Primary Industries and um, he can fill you in on some of the work that he's doing. The next one is mole boarding can turn up acid soil. So it's quite common with mole board ploughing that you might apply lime at, on the surface and then plough um, the soil and tip it up. And what you can find is you'll see on the picture there, you can see that the, the ploughs inverted the soil and you've got this nice layer of lime um, and topsoil. And on the surface, they've come back and applied some lime post ploughing. But what has happened is it's left this acidic layer um, in, the, in the middle. So, and that's actually slowed the crop down and has earned out to grow as well. So keeping this in mind, um, you need to understand what the acid profile is. So not just at the surface, but you need to understand at least down to 50 centimetres um, and or just below the depth that you're actually ploughing. And in, some, this, in this case, if you have an acidic profile all the way down, perhaps moldboard ploughing isn't actually the best option. You might be better with spading or something that'll give you a bit more mixing to um, incorporate the lime. And this is another lesson one of the farmers up here um, learnt this year that generally when they spade, they apply lime out in front of the spading and then mix it. But this year at the end of seeding, um, when they start their seeding program, they were getting a bit tired and they didn't have, or they ran out of time to put some lime on. And he's kicking himself because what you can see here, these, these patches in the crop, um, is actually got this aluminium toxicity. And when they went in and tested them, they found that these patches were actually really acidic. So he's learnt his lesson for next year um, to remember to apply or to make the effort and apply the lime first. Now this is a big one. So the risk of erosion um, is greater in autumn. And I guess I'm talking particularly about in Western Australia where we have predominantly sandy soils and we do tend to get really strong winds um, in autumn that come in before the, the fronts. So this is actually, and this is not a new lesson, like we've known this for a long time. This is um, the example you can see is from Narradup down south in Southern Western Australia. And in the background, the green area is um, the control and in front, it's a paddock that they've mole boarded. So uh, in West Australia on the 24th of May this year, we had a huge wind erosion event and we did see some um, very extreme erosion and soil amelioration has been blamed for that, which I think is a little bit unfair. Um, so we need to actually put it in context because the percentage of um, or amelioration is actually much lower than the scale of erosion that we saw. It was an extreme wind event. So we had over 80 kilometers an hour winds for over six and a half hours, um, which is very intense. And we were coming off the back of a um, poor year last year. So we had very um, low stubble. And I think also, you know, farming systems have changed now because of the way the climate is. We do a lot more dry sowing. So, um, and it was paddocks that were dry sown that did tend to see a lot of erosion. And we've also changed our farming and we're all up and back farming in one direction. So I guess um, 
it, you know, that the, the erosion was in not just ameliorated or even controlled traffic paddocks, it was across um, in, in all farming systems. But it is really important when you're doing soil amelioration to be aware of that risk of, um, of, of uh, the erosion. And we don't recommend uh, any inversion ploughing or, or um, mixing in, um, in autumn. It's best to wait until conditions are moist when you can actually establish a cover crop. So one option is um, at, ameliorating in a fallow uh, or, or a pasture. So this works well um, in, in some farming systems. Although do keep in mind, as this farmer found that October, this is uh, in the middle of October, can be too late to mob or plow establish a cover crop, um, as there's actually a greater risk of no follow-up rain. And you can see in this picture that the, the poor sand here actually didn't um, germinate. Although the farmer has since sent me a picture um, of the paddock in March after they got some summer rain, and thankfully um, he did get cover back on, on his sandy areas. But it's something to be um, mindful of is um, perhaps you need to ameliorate a little bit earlier. And the other part about it is what we found um, is that it's actually better to moldboard plough and spade wet rather than dry. So this picture here, you can see um, the one on the left is showing the in inversion result that they got from dry spading, whereas the inversion was much better with wet on, on the left-hand side. So it is a benefit to wait till you have moisture um, and then one, you get a better inversion and you, the soil is left um, less exposed if you go back in and seed straight away to get the cover crop back up or a crop going. Now the other side of it is, if we're talking ripping, um, it can be too wet for ripping. Um, so if you can actually, and this is particularly in heavier, heavier soil, so this is a red line soil, this picture. So if you can get a handful of soil and um, roll a sausage, then it's actually um, too wet for ripping. And this is what happens then is rather than um, shatter, the tines shattering, they just um, smear and leave a slot which um, isn't really, it's making a channel through the soil, but it's not really busting up that compaction aroma. Uh, we've also found um, in Western Australia that there's really little benefit to, to deep ripping our heavier soil types. So here, um, this one was a sodic dispersive calcareous earth. And this pictures you can see here, we're from deep ripping um, in I think it was in early March and it was really clotty. So you can see this, the bar's actually got a picture of some topsoil um, inclusion plates, which it just was too hard to pull. So they had to take, um, take them off because they just couldn't get them in the ground. And what they left even when they took off the um, topsoil inclusion plates was this really clotty surface that did actually have an impact on um, plant establishment. So this trial uh, had different depths of ripping um, and it was quite shallow to 300. In this um, instance, they actually had to do two passes just to be able to get the tines into down to 300 deep. Initially, they were trying to get down to 500 mils. And they also applied some gypsum. So there was an impact on plant establishment um, with the, the ripping, so it reduced the plant establishment. Um, the yield in 2008 and 2019, the yield did recover, but there's actually no difference between whether it was ripped or unripped or plus and minus gypsum. Um, it was quite two very dry years as well, um, but it, the return on investment there, if we calculate it out, shows a negative um, return on investment from ripping and gypsum. So we haven't seen many trials where in these um, our heavy or low, we call them heavy loam soils, but they're not compared to soils like Charlie has. Um, there's, there's little benefit to deep ripping. And that's um, quite understandable because a, a loam or a clay soil can ha has a higher plant available water capacity. So they store more water up in the top um, 10 to 20 or 30 centimetres as composed to a sand where to be able to get um, more water, the plant roots need to be able to get deeper um, to access the water. So bloopers commonly occur when the treatment's not applicable for all soil types in a paddock. And that's particularly uh, the duplex soils and more variable soils. So this is quite common in Western Australia in down south. 
um, where we have more complex soils and multiple soils within a paddock. So this is an example, um, comes down from experiments of delving um, in 10 to 60 centimetre duplex soils. Uh, with delving, you can actually bring up too much clay. And that's not good if it's a sodic saline clay and high in boring. So um, you can see down here that the um, sodium percentages are quite high and the boron levels um, are quite high, um, which has actually been a problem in this soil. So the farmer, um, this was done 10 years ago and the farmer has actually seen like a detriment to the delving in this case, so 10 years after treatment. So this is a picture of uh, what he saw from the header last year. And um, in the middle, this is a stone that's undelved um, and either side was delved. So um, because they had such, uh, brought up such heavy clumps and things, they did actually spade the whole paddock. So the um, yield results I'm going to show you are not actually a difference between delved or undelved. They're a difference between delved and spading or delved. But the whole treatment cost that ended up after he delved it and put gypsum and cultivated it 10 times to try and get out of the um, clumps was about $500. Um, so this um, penalty that he's seeing is actually not across the whole paddock. This is a picture of um, his yield map um, from last year. And you can see um, along here, it's his, um, where he's left his delve strip. So we've got um, delved, um, sorry, the not delved strip um, in the middle and the delved either side. And I've actually split it into two zones. So zone one is this shallow duplex and you can see there's a yield penalty um, in the delved strip. So where that clay was much closer to the surface. And zone two is a deeper sandy duplex. So there was more sand um, on top of the clay. And what it, what it shows um, when we plot the yield response in tonnes per hectare versus um, you can see on the other side is the rainfall. So the yellow line is the rainfall. But in dry seasons, there's been actually a penalty of the delving. So what's happened by bringing up too much clay, he's essentially turned the, um, the, the soil into one of his heavier soils that does perform poorly um, in a dry year when it doesn't get enough moisture. So in um, 2011 and 2019, there was a well, 50 and 30% yield penalty from that, the delving. So if we have a look um, at that return on investment, so if the delving versus no delving, remembering that the whole paddock was actually um, sated, um, you can see that, so the, the um, Zone one is the dark blue, which was that shallow duplex, and zone two is that, that deeper duplex, so there is more of a benefit. Um, it, we actually um, lost money from the delving, so it was an expensive exercise, and um, in, in this case, um, it wasn't worth the delving, and in fact, he's made a bigger problem for himself now because the, um, it's much more inconsistent yielding in some areas. So what are some of the solutions to perhaps avoid this blooper is... Uh, bring up less clay, so don't dig as deep, or perhaps just the spading was in fact um, a safer option because you're not bringing up so much from underneath. So you could, um, you could ameliorate this paddock by zone, so zone out those shallower, nasty duplexes. And um, the farmer did actually try to do depth to clay mats at the time of delving using the EM and gamma. But what he found is the map actually wasn't that accurate because there was an underlying salinity um, and higher moisture um, that actually didn't help pull out the differences in those soils. Um, I think one thing that we could try would be to use, compare the yield or biomass um, in dry versus a wet season and perhaps that might pick up some of those, um, the, soil, the, the soil type difference. So now instead, the farmer, he's been claying out his poor sandy patches. He hasn't actually done any more um, delving and he's actually improved his seeding system. So he's designed his own seeding system that actually, um, it's a disc seeder that scouts the water repellent soil away. Um, so it's out of the way and allows the furrow to wet up. Now, moorboard ploughing can also be a problem in duplex soils and can leave the surface cloddy. So it's about understanding what you're actually going to be ploughing up 
um, is, is the critical factor here. And these, cloddy, um, these clods do actually impede emergence. So this is a, a trial done in 2013 down at Ravensthorpe by Dirk Backer uh, from Department of Agriculture. And you can see here that the moorboard ploughing the plants was 83 plants per metre squared compared to the control, which was 92 plants per square metre. This trial was a trial, a large scale demo, and it was run over two years. So the blue, um, um, bars you can see here are the yield from 2013 and the um, orange ones are from 2014. And in 2013, there was no, actually in all of it, there was no significant difference in, in yield. Um, and in fact, the mole boarding and spading in 2013 was a penalty, which was due to those um, big odds that reduced the emergence. So there was a little bit of um, a recovery in the second year in 2014, and it looks, uh, you know, it indicated that the mold wooding and spading did start to yield a bit more, but there was huge variability um, in the results. And part of that, um, so that the, distance, uh, the difference wasn't actually significant. And if we have a look at return on investment, so the cost of moldboard ploughing, in this case, we've um, used $120 and moldboarding and spading was $270. And there was actually a, a return on investment over the two years for the moldboard ploughing and the moldboarding and spading, I guess it's a higher cost and we haven't seen the yield benefit or the penalty. So there was also a range of different treatments for non-wetting soil to treat non-wetting soils in this trial. And one of the other ones was um, off-row seeding. And that um, actually had a positive return on investment. And I guess it's because it didn't lose the yield like the others. So after seven years, um, this is a picture of that same paddock and those clumps are still there. So they haven't actually broken down, even though it's been rolled every year since 2017 and it, uh, in 2014 and in 2017, they put a speed tiller over it. Um, the farmer said the lumps are smaller, now smaller than a fist, which I guess indicates that they were much bigger in the beginning. And it's still having um, a negative effect on the crop in places. So um, the solution, well, he also looked at zoning for depth to clay um, with the M and the gamma, but what he's found is that the variability is much higher than the sampling resolution. So the sampling resolution was, is about 24 metres swath width, but these patches of clay are actually much smaller than that. So they're not being um, picked up as easily. Um, he now also targets his um, sandy patches and clays those out. Uh, and he puts a minimum of 100 tonnes of clay on them for those patches. And he's gone to um, on-row or, or next to near-row seeding um, using the I-tool machine to, to inter-row seed. He's also just um, got a better distribution of nutrients and he's gone to a disc seeder um, as well to, uh, to place that seed more precisely. Right, so another one that seems kind of obvious um, that we've learned is that lime must be in contact with acid soil to be effective. Um, and I guess that is pretty obvious. Um, but what we found you know, in the past, we've been applying lime um, historically on the surface and um, it will fix the top. But if you've got an acidic profile, it actually doesn't um, improve the um, pH to depth. It will take a long time. Um, so we have found that some kind of incorporation um, will speed that process up. Um, having said that, we do have a trial in the low rainfall area east of Geraldton, about 100 kilometres, that's an eight-year trial, and we have seen in that soil type, um, lower rainfall soil type, there has been a benefit just of applying lime um, without the incorporation. But the photos that you're looking at here are um, some work by Gauss's and the Department of Agriculture on the GRDC-funded soil acidity project. Um, and it's looking, so the one on the left you can see is a soil profile with no lime applied. And on the right, it's had lime and a, just a shallow incorporation on the top. And the, the dark staining you can see is from the dye indicator. But when they went and took a closer look at the root profile, they actually found that the roots hadn't gone any deeper really with the shallow one than they had with no lime. So, they had a go at re-engineering the soil profile. So they actually dug it all out and then put back in layers of soil and, and lime to try and achieve the optimum profile to see what would happen um, if 
you could incorporate and put that line down to 45 centimetres. Then they had a look using this little camera, 360 degree camera um, underneath um, to have a look at where the plant roots had, uh, the plant roots had grown. And these are some of the pictures that they, they took. So this is the soil depth from the surface zero down to 60. We have a control, um, no compaction, and then the compaction plus lime. And what they found is that in the control, the plant roots here went down to about 20 um, centimetres. And you can see there's an odd one down deeper, but most are in the top 20 centimetres. Um, if you took away all the compaction, the plant roots grow um, nice downly. Uh, that, so this is without any lime. They actually grew um, down to about 60 centimetres. And then if you took away the um, compaction and incorporate lime, you actually got more um, plant roots below um, or down to 65 and they're actually finer roots. So you got a lot more, a better root growth. So that's all really good, great work. We know we can um, take away compaction and, and put lime um, and reduce the pH, but what does that mean in reality? Well, some of the guys have found in reality, when you're plowing and deep ripping your acid sands to mix that lime, you can find rocks. And they can be really big rocks. And they can break. So um, this apparently, this is a, well, this is a, is a new found ripper. And this hydraulic arm is meant to be the, the like more serious um, um, arm that's meant to be good for rocks. But that obviously when you're pulling out rocks like that, you can just bend the arm. So what's their solution? Well, they've actually um, been developing some amelioration maps. And um, they've done these, they've come up with the deep ripping map. So they've used the um, airborne radiometrics, the gamma thorium layer to, um, the thorium in West Australia is very good at picking up the iron stone gravels and rocky areas. So what they've done is they actually zone out this area that's called a rock warning zone. Now, because it's airborne radiometrics, it's a wide um, resolution at often a hundred meters. Um, it won't pick up like individual rocky patches. So rather than lift the ripper over these areas, they just have a warning zone, which um, reminds the, um, the tractor driver to be a little bit, bit more awake. So they load these uh, screens or these maps up into the 2630 John Deere screens and they can actually see where they are on the map. Um, they've also had a problem with vlogging and, um, and they've actually now put in these, um, you can see the hashed areas, which are exclusion zones and some tracks through the middle of the paddock. So these are their like roadways and access ways so that they don't rip or plough the, um, the headlands and these access tracks so the machines actually don't get bogged. And on the right hand side, you can see that they also do one for one way ploughing. So their system in the fellow, this is in the low rainfall um, out east of um, Meriden. They, in the, in, in the fallow year, they'll apply lime and then they one way plough it and establish a cover crop. And then they come back in in um, September, August, September and deep rip out that deeper compaction. Now the other thing after amelioration, we found that the soil is soft. So it's after ploughing, you can see there's some really good bog marks here or after deep ripping, um, it, the trafficability can be a real problem and it, it can be very, very soft, especially when you're lucky enough to get some rain. So it's one um, experience that one of the farmers found after they'd done some um, soil inversion. So one of the solutions, well, a lot of found that you um, need to use a roller when ripping. So this helps just firm the surface and get a nice, uh, nice even seedbed. Now you do need to be a little bit careful with what roller you use. This is a nice, this flat roller works really well um, if you have really high stubble loads um, and good um, wheat straw. But risk of erosion can be a bit of a problem. So, um, you know, you might want to use a roller that's got some ridges. Um, some guys will not roll until just before they seed, they'll, they'll rip and then and roll it at the last minute. Um, others will do it in, in one pass. So with, um, when you're gonna roll it, it is best to keep in mind that cereals are best. So we had a lot of severe erosion where we had up here where we um, had ripped and rolled in our canolas or, or looping stubble. So, 
So other is hey, after amelioration, I guess this is not just ripping, but um, other sorts of amelioration is having a cedar with independent depth control um, because it can, um, that just is a bit more, more forgiving. Um, that match your wheel tracks because it is really boggy. Um, so going into control traffic is a good thing, particularly it's actually protecting your investment. So if you're going to invest all your money in um, improving the soil condition, the last thing we want to do is squash it back up. 80% of compaction happens in the first pass. And I guess guys have come unstuck where their wheels haven't been quite matched. So often um, we're pretty close to, to three metres, but sometimes some machines are and some machines aren't. So if your machines aren't quite matched, they have down, um, it's quite easy to fall off the tram lines. So you, to avoid this, you can leave the wheel tracks um, or the tram lines unripped, which is good because it protects that benefit of running on firm tracks. But some guys have found you can fall off, particularly at spraying. So if you get a bit of a, the signal in the GPS drops out or you just get up a bit of a wobble, you can fall off. Uh, so sometimes just running the time a little bit shallower in the wheel track so you get like a shallow trench that the machines will sit in after the first pass can help. Um, the other one, it can be quite after the first pass and it sinks. This is particularly if you've spaded because with spading, um, you can't actually take out um, to avoid your wheel tracks. So renovating your tracks is really important. And I think in CTF systems in general, it's important to maintain your wheel tracks. And I guess the another option is potentially um, the cross ripping, which being um, a believer in controlled traffic, I guess I'm not really particularly keen on cross ripping, but the measurements I have taken of farms where they have cross ripped um, the machines and then, so they cross rip it and then we'll go um, at the usual angle for the rest of the traffic. I have actually measured that the wheels don't sink as much. Um, but I know some of the guys that have done that now, while it helped um, this first time, they have found that um, over time, so the more passes you do on, on the tram lines, the actual rougher you can get. So they're finding that it is a bit bumpy now, particularly at, which is a problem at harvest, um, if you're harvesting short crops. Um, so some of the guys I know that have cross-ripped have um, had trouble last year getting the crop into the front. But I guess, you know, this is some of the results of what happened from that big wind that we had on the 24th of May, and it was very devastating. So these two paddocks had both been seeded. The one on the left had canola, um, and the one on the right was actually a wheat, wheat crop. So part of our challenge is, you know, how to recover this. So these paddocks, these two paddocks actually were reseeded um, and it's actually removing the, the wheel tracks. So the wind, we had a particular problem. The wind was from the north uh, or northwest, oh, sorry, northeast actually. So um, tracks that were on the north um, south actually got hit really hard. And we also found that, um, as I mentioned, like other paddocks that weren't CTF blew away as well. But what's happened in the CTF, we found that the, um, the straw and the stubble here actually caught the, a lot of the soil. So it's actually kept, when you dig underneath, there's actually a lot of all, all the organic that is sitting underneath that sand. But because it's um, eroded down those wheel tracks and these headlands here, there's actually almost a, um, a foot in places. They've lost the headland. That's how much the headlands have gone down. It, the paddock is so uneven. So that it's the seeding into it and the managing afterwards that is the problem. And I suspect, um, you know, some guys have gone and Kelly changed it, chained it and leveled it out before they reseeded it. And um, others are probably going to have to look at something like cross ripping and to try and smooth it back and start again. So I did um, actually have another, oh no, we'll go with this one. Um, so I guess it's important to keep in mind is, is with amelioration particularly to minimise that wind erosion risk. So, and it's for any farming system as well. It's not just um, CTF or um, amelioration. So we want to aim to keep as much stubble as possible over the summer months. And um, we need ideally above 50% stubble with 30% anchored. So below that level um, is when it's at a higher risk of um, erosion. Minimise the, the stock and machinery traffic. Um, so I guess we all sort of know that. And I think particularly, you know, when you see those pictures there with controlled traffic, where we are concentrating the traffic in one place, it just shows you now 
how fragile our headlands are that are kind of like the problem we had with stock pants where you can concentrate um, the stock in one place and blow it away. It can happen on the headlands. So I think there's um, a bit of a challenge for us is to now, um, we have an efficient system is actually when you're designing paddock layouts, you need to keep in mind perhaps the direction of the prevailing winds and even wind break. So to get um, maximum efficiency from our machinery now, we have, do have less trees and um, things in, in the landscape, but perhaps there were some of those, um, one of the paddocks I knew that blew really badly, they'd taken out the tree line at the um, part way up the hill to help get a longer run. And in actual fact, it's quite a susceptible um, poor soil there. So maybe, you know, a windbreak or, or some kind of break there may actually be effective. Um, I did have some other pictures in there that I seem to have took out that are aware of the headlands that had blown away and it has actually recovered. So it, it, it's not all lost, it, it does recover and it's about minimising that risk um, in, in future years so that, so that we can hopefully prevent it from happening again. So in conclusion, when we're talking soil amelioration, whatever you know, uh, whatever method you're using, it's really important that you know your soil properties, particularly in 10 centimetre increments um, to depth. And I guess particularly it's looking for things like soil pH and um, the clay content, and perhaps if you've got a heavier soil, it's like the boron toxicity and um, other things that are going to be a problem if you bring to the surface. So make sure you ameliorate to the conditions, not the calendar. So amelioration does tend to work when it's moist, um, which is always a competition with seeding, um, one for machinery, and two, if you're putting it at the end of the program, you've been going for a while and you're pretty tired. So the temptation is to do it earlier. Um, and maybe it'll be less hectares, um, essentially. And then if in doubt, um, leave it out. So as you're doing the amelioration, make sure you check out and uh, get out of the tractor and check on the job or if you've got other people on the tractor for you, don't just leave them and then come back, at, you know, when it's finished. Because um, a lot of some mistakes and things you might pick up a little bit earlier and know perhaps that's not the right soil type or the place for that amelioration or the machine needs to be adjusted so that you can avoid something happening in the future. So thank you. I'd just like to acknowledge um, that this work has been put together by the Department of uh, primary industries and GRDC um, projects. So our earlier soil constraints west projects and our new re-engineering soils and post amelioration projects. We've got a whole deeper team that's helped me and um, a long list of growers. So I thank the growers very much um, for letting me share with you um, some of their bloopers. And I hope you've learned some valuable lessons for undertaking amelioration in the future. All right, are there any questions? Yeah, Bindi, Nigel Wilhelm here. Bindi, we've been doing some amelioration as well and hopefully sort of moving from a spader to a deep ripper to incorporate ameliorants, um, organic matter or lime. Have you done much of that as a, how effective that is at incorporating stuff but leaving the, the profile more stable or the surface more stable? Yeah, we have, and um, so we've done a lot of work on the deep ripping with topsoil inclusion plates um, with Paul Blackwell, and we found that it helps. Um, it, it does help put it down the, the profile. So deep ripping on our own doesn't move it much, um, but I guess you get a little bit of incorporation and perhaps better water infiltration that helps move things. And the topsoil slotting will drop the line and topsoil um, at depth but they certainly don't have the same um, effect, at, you know, as the, the spading or, or the one-way ploughing. But I think it, it does come down to, you know, what constraint you actually have. Because we have found in places that where we've got acidity and deep ripping that actually by removing the compaction first has actually given a really good yield benefit um, and has been a bigger limitation than the acidity and, and the ploughing line. Um, and yeah, that, that erosion risk and I think maintaining stubble and things is really important. So we have seen the topsoil slotting, um, I've got some great examples of where that's worked really well, but it is kind of optimal conditions, I think, for topsoil slotting. You need to have that dry topsoil and the moist subsoil underneath so you get the, the soil flow um, down behind the, between the plates. I was wondering whether we might get to a stage where we drop the ameliorant in lines 
in front of the tine, the deep ripper tines, you know, in a auto steer configuration and improving ah, the So like plate. feeding it, you mean like putting it down a tube in front or something like that? Or just in bands. So instead of broadcasting it, actually concentrating it where the deep ripper tine is going to go and try and improve that rate of incorporation. Yeah, I, I think you probably time. have to have something leading in front of it, wouldn't you, to open the slot to allow it to go down? With um, inclusion plates, not enough. Well, like to, uh, you mean inject the, um, like say lime or whatever, down the behind in, into the inclusion plates. Uh, what we've tried is actually banding the stuff prior, so broadcasting it, but not right across the paddock, but in lines where we anticipate the deep ripping times to go. Oh yeah. In coming through with a ripper with inclusion plates. Yep. Hoping that that will end up with more ameliorant down the hole than if we broadcast the whole paddock. Yeah, well, I guess it's then matter, a matter of getting back on the right track. I mean, ideally, you'd want to inject the material, and we looked into it behind the times. Actually, Laura, you're online. Um, I think we were going to have a go down with Warakiri, um, injecting manure and, and pellets and things behind the ripping, the ripping times. Yeah, yeah, we've done that this year um, just by, yeah, we had slots on the back of the tines um, and just used like a simplicity bin um, on the front of the tractor to feed a, like organic matter, yeah, pellets um, and different fertilisers and that kind of thing through um, hoses and then down into the, onto the back of the tines and managed to rip that to 40 centimetres and kind of disperse throughout the profile. And how's it looking? Been looking this year? Um, oh, it's a pretty, it's a pretty even kind of spot where we've put it. I suppose there's not huge, huge differences um, because it's a paddock that's been ripped and spaded. And um, yeah, we've had you know the regular Estrance coastal season, I suppose. So um, not huge differences yet. But um, yeah, we'll see. There's soil test data will be yeah taken throughout, and I think it'll be one of those longer term projects where you need to be you know, you might not see results, especially with given like chicken manure and that kind of thing that usually the breakdown and actual benefit comes in that, you know, latter kind of second, third year. Yeah, I think part of the injecting the material is actually the machinery to be able to do it effectively. Um, I know back 10 years ago, they were looking at injecting lime through air seeders, but I think there's much better um, technology systems now. Like the one that you used, Laura, was the one you used for spader seeding, wasn't it? That um, been, been, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was just the same as what we were using on the spade of cedar and then the ripper was the department's ripper. Um, yeah, it, it definitely, I mean, obviously the a lot of the manure trials are based on broadacre spreading. And so that's one of the things in that I know a lot of the amelioration work done by Southern Farming Systems in Victoria found that they needed, you know, kind of five to seven tonne a hectare of manure and obviously that's, you know, that was brought out, that was, yeah, we just can't, you know, you can't go over. I think our max was like maybe 300 kilos a hectare that we could actually get down without just completely blocking the system. So that is one of the hindrances is that you might not be able to get your product through your hoses and out of the, uh, out of the bin, I suppose. I think like in concentrating in lines um, is, you know, quite a good thing, Nigel. And that's probably like that ribbons of fertility, as you remember Bill Bowden, <laughs> um, yes. yeah. Department of Ag used to go on about ribbons of fertility 15 years ago. And we, now with precise seeding technologies, there is a lot more opportunity to be able to, you know, seed back into those rows or ribbons of fertility and make the most of them. And then you're not having to um, apply it across the whole paddock or could go back in in future in the gap. Yeah. Questions? There any more? I I guess I've kind of got a question, Bindi, um, regarding your roofing on an angle and the roughness. Was that was that those the guys that are kind of roofing around the clock, um, different angles, and then is it or is it the first year after roofing on an angle that they found it was getting rougher as they trafficked it throughout the season? Yeah, it's actually the first year. So uh, guys up here, they needed 
the reason they do that was they actually need to renovate their tracks so they're getting really deep spray tracks. So we don't tend to rotate our tracks so often over here in WA, they just use the same spraying tracks and they're getting much deeper. And they just decided for 20,000 hectares, they didn't want to have another machine running um, in summer. So they try the cross ripping. And also what their problem, so unlike a lot of um, heavier soil wheel tracks in the sand, we're tending to get these big humps um, rather than in, in wet, it pushes up on the edge and then the current renovators kind of just draw the soil back in and, and pack it back down. Whereas um, it, and that's a bit hard because you've sunk so much and they often, you know, they're, some of the um, ruts are now 80 centimetres or more sort of wide. So that's why they cross ripped. And yeah, they, they actually, so in the beginning, they were really happy with it. They just go at like five degrees, the rip off. But then they said last year they found, and, and they're also ripping really deep, so down to 500, 550. And they said basically the first two passes, so seeding was fine, but it was the ones that was sort of the spraying or last the last spray in the wet conditions that were starting to get rough again. So they were feeling every sort of ridge. And then the problem they had was at harvest, I think also because last year they were chasing really short looping crops. And the, the um, header front, which the 40 foot platform was just getting too much of a wobble. So they had to slow the speed right down um, to do it. So I guess they said, you know, they've compensated by slowing the speed down at harvest, but there's always a trade off, isn't there, between either their trade off for not doing that extra renovation and operation was they've had to slow down um, at harvest time to, to do that. I don't think we've kind of found a good solution to that up here. I think someone needs to build a new track renovator for our sands. Oh, hundred percent. I know I was going to interject when Charlie said about using the grizzly because we've just never had success, but I'm, then I'm like, we're in a whole different system and now everything's so soft because we rip every like second year. But, um, but yeah, we're definitely looking at improving our, um, improving our wheel track renovator, whether it be buying a better one or dragging, um, just trying to compact the tracks as soon as you renovate them. So I actually like dragging uh, one of the local guys drags um, like tires behind his wheel track renovator on the trams um, that are just full of water so that then they can actually push it down because we find that by fluffing the soil up and putting it back in the middle, it just ruts straight back out as soon as you traffic it again. Um, because of the sand and yeah, know I was just wondering about the ripping on an angle because after our Geraldton trip we ended up doing that but uh, this year a large portion on an angle to try and break up the domes that weren't shattering from the new fab um, between the tines and it's worked really well in breaking up the domes but then when you said that I was like oh no don't tell me we just <laughs> made it up <laughs> <laughs> oh well it'll be interesting to see um, if you have the same problem um, yeah I think that packing down after that renovation is a really important point. And the, I know the grizzly ones haven't tended to work in here in WA because they don't pack it down so much. So I think that, um, you know, they've added a few different things and there's a couple of new ones on the market now that will draw in the soil and stubble and pack it and having it um, a bit moist, I think too, with the renovation, that's a bit of a key to pack down the stubble. And I saw up in Geraldton, um, because obviously this wind erosion has been a big factor. We had a field day and we went and saw some renovate, a renovator that was with the K-Line um, renovator. And it actually did a really good job of packing um, the stubble in and it had a chaff decks behind it. So having the chaff decks there and put a bit of extra organic matter um, has helped too. Uh, and then I saw uh, the, you know, the next neighbours used a flat track renovator and his were north, south on a um, slope that faced north south of the sand and things blew like buggery because they just um, renovated earlier and then the wind came in and it actually though it, it eroded down the side of the tracks because the renovator um, the flat tracks packed the soil nicely but it actually renovated in the gap between where the packed soil was from the renovator and the edge of the tram line where it was nice and soft and that's the bit that actually blew out oh wow yeah no it was I think intense. it's just kind of bad timing, you know, bad timing a little bit. Like some of the erosion we saw on the south coast in 2017 with the, the water, um, there was a big mm -hmm. flood, that was the same. But some of the tracks that had just been renovated that, you know, that season, they were the ones that kind of eroded. They hadn't had a pass of traffic to pack them down again. Yeah, yeah. 
It is a, it is a problem. Yeah, people love being pessimists though, like <laughs> with the wind erosion, like I just like, yeah, that event was incredible. I know Geraldton copped it worse than Esperance, but I, I didn't sleep for about three days because I thought my roof was about to blow off <laughs> um, it was so bad. So, um, yeah, anything, nothing was going to withstand it, but people love any excuse to hate on something. <laughs> it was yes. yeah, it was just a good reminder, I think, that it's <laughs> And, and it you know raises a lot of questions because before that first rain we do get lots of wind like that's quite typical of our farming system so it's something that we need to be you know keeping in our minds yeah for sure we found with renovating our track well, no, it's a different soil type than that but we we renovate them before cereals because that's our lowest traffic crop um, during the season so we, yep. We generally renovate before before a cereal crop. It's normally only a spreader, a couple of spreader passes and a one or two sprayer passes compared to a legume or canola where we're on them all the time. And we actually renovate them, then we just pack them back down, we drive the tractor back over them again. That's, that's the heaviest thing we've got pretty much. And that just leaves a the actual tread mark in them and packs them down. So we sort of does mean doing two passes. A little hobby farmers that they have for us. Yep, that's a, a good point. What kind of renovator are you using, Luke? Blue one. The blue one. <laughs> Grizzly. <laughs> Grizzly. <laughs> Charlie's Grizzly. Maintaining wheel tracks is something that's really important that we often forget. Like with CTF or any farming system, it's not a set and forget thing. Like you still need to um, do the maintenance of the system throughout. All right, is that it for questions? Great. Well, um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining in. I'd particularly like to thank um, Ping in Victoria, for Nikki and Catherine, um, for setting up the, the webinar. And um, it's great we've managed to work this time. We did have a bit of a fail last time, so it's wonderful to um, get the technology working. Um, and I'd just like to remind you that if you aren't a member of ACFA and you'd like to be, you can go to our website um, and um, you'll, we'd love to have you join us as a member and um, share lots of good ideas about, about controlled traffic and an opportunity to network and discuss topics um, like these ones. Um, thanks very much, Charlie, um, for your fantastic presentation as well. It was great to hear what you're up to um, with your system. And I think that's it, is it? Um, thank you very much for joining in all around the world. Willem, you can go back to bed now for a couple of hours and um, we'll look forward to seeing you at the next event.